We bring to you the love and greetings of some 6,000 brothers and sisters in the New York State Bethel family and also the governing body. So please accept their warm love and greetings to you. I can say with all sincerity that you have certainly built lovely properties here and you have reason to be proud over the works of your hands. However, today we're going to talk about building, not how to build, but why to build these buildings. Especially so since we look into the Bible and read in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 24, that our God Jehovah does not dwell in buildings made with hands. Neither is he attended to by human hands as though he needed anything. So it gives us thought to think about buildings. The prophet Moses reminded the Israelites before they crossed the river Jordan to enter the promised land. We read in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 12, Watch out for yourselves, that you do not forget Jehovah your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. It is almost unthinkable, incredible that we could think that the Israelites could ever, ever forget Jehovah. After he had freed them from the slavery of Egypt and made them a great nation. But the truth is, they did forget him. And that is something that concerns us. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And could the same happen to us at this time of the end? Paul the Apostle, writing to the book of, or writing to the Hebrews, we read in the book of Hebrews that it all happened because the Israelites lacked a living faith in Jehovah. They did have a sort of a faith, but not a living one. We read in the book of John, John chapter 6 verse 10, we learn that after Jesus performed this great miracle wherein he fed some 5,000 with bread and fish, the Jews there wanted to make him a king. But Jesus withdrew from them and saying that his kingdom was no part of this world. In substance, he told them, you want to make me a king because I've fed you. Not that you believe in me. Because I made your stomachs feel full. Then Jesus said, work not for the food that perishes but work for the food that remains for everlasting life. And they said, What shall we do? And Jesus said to them, Exercise faith in God. Yes, and exercise faith in the one whom he has sent forth. And then they turned to Jesus and they said, Show us a sign that you are that one the Messiah. Moses gave us manna as a sign. What will you give us? So Jesus turned to them and said, Moses gave you nothing. Moses couldn't even make a blade of grass to grow, let alone a manna. It was my father, Jehovah, that gave you the manna. You saw and ate the manna, but you did not see, nor even remember the one who provided it for you. You see only the things that are physical, but your eyes are closed to the one 
who feeds you, who cares for you. You do not see the Spirit, the living God. Truthfully, this may very well be one of the great dangers, our great dangers that we face at this time of the end. We see very easily the physical, but it's hard for us to see what is behind the things that are happening on the face of the earth, and harder yet to see the hand of Jehovah guiding his people, gathering them out of all nations, kindreds, and peoples and tongues. We want to see the physical without seeing and acknowledging the provider of it all. Let us not forget Jehovah our God. Let us not only see our kingdom halls and our assembly halls and these beautiful facilities that have been built by sweat, blood, and some tears, I suppose. And but let us also see Jehovah at work in the hearts and minds of those who did the building, who were motivated by spirit who saw in this all the will of God to be done on earth. Yes, let us see this, that we might worship the living God in spirit and truth. In our halls and in these buildings, we want to learn to see the unseeable. Moses, the Bible tells us, saw the unsealable God. We here, living at this time of the end, want to see the unseeable, the Creator at work in the lives of people. We want to be able to think the unthinkable, the unthinkable thoughts of God inspired. We want to think about a kingdom ruling over this earth. We want to think about the beauties of the kingdom, the resurrection of the dead, people living forever. Unthinkable thoughts, but they're there in the Bible to inspire us to faith, to move ahead. And then let the Holy Spirit move us to do that which men think impossible, to carry out the will of God, not to be afraid to go out and knock on doors and tell people about the kingdom that is going to take possession of the earth and bring this old world to ruin and make of this beautiful planet a paradise. So we want to be prepared to do the impossible, see the unseeable, think the unthinkable, and by God's Spirit do that which is impossible. It's impossible to man, but not to God. And we are God's fellow workers. Never forget it. When people turn their eyes and ears in the direction of our building, and our buildings, whatever they may be, let them see not only the building, but also let them see and feel our rejoicing. Let them hear our singing of our kingdom songs. Wasn't it beautiful to hear those songs sang? But you go into some kingdom halls and you almost strain your ears because the voices are so afraid to make a mistake or something of that nature. It's nice to sing like this. So let them hear our kingdom songs. Let them experience the joy that is ours in the worshiping of the true and living God, Jehovah. So let them come, let them see, and let them worship side by side with us because that is the intention of the living God, to save all who want to look for righteousness and truth upon the face of the earth. But at this time now, let's talk about building with a view to the Spirit. You want to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 127, and we'll begin reading verse 1 there. And notice what it says there, unless Jehovah himself builds the house, it is to no avail that its builders have worked hard on it. Read 
needed to stop, think, meditate, penetrate, reason on what it is saying. Think on these words for a moment. It says that Jehovah builds houses. Have you with your naked eye ever seen Jehovah build a house? But that's what the Bible says. Jehovah builds houses. Unless we see Jehovah building a house, we have yet to learn what the truth is all about. Jehovah, by means of his spirit, is acting through us to do his will. And so when you see men doing things to the glory of the great God Jehovah, they're being motivated by Jehovah, and through them Jehovah is getting his work done. Now down through history, one of the chief concerns of man was the building of houses for himself and his family. Building has always been and still is a major industry throughout the world. In fact, the building industry today is booming. It's one of the biggest industries. A house serves for many purposes. It, saves as, it serves as a living quarters. It's a shelter at times, a place of protection from the bad weather, a place to raise a family. And I don't know about you, every now and then it's a place to call home. It's a lovely thing to go home. Dvorak wrote his fifth symphony, and he called it going home. In the Bible, times houses were also used as places of worship. At Colossians chapter 4, verse 15 and Philemon 2, we read of the congregation in houses. And down to this day, houses are used as places of worship throughout the world, even now. You wouldn't believe it, but in Central and South America, Asia, the islands of the seas, people come in houses and worship the great God Jehovah. We have circuit and district assemblies held in houses in many parts of the earth. We have Bible studies being conducted in houses in these simple dwellings. For years now, the society has been stressing the need for us to think about the simplicity of living, for us not to get very complicated, tied down with the ways of life of the system of things. Also in Bible times, the wisdom of simple living was stressed, the simplicity of life was recommended, and Jesus put it in these words in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. He says, Keep your eye simple. Your whole body will be bright if your eye is simple. If not, in reality, this is what will happen, he says. The light that is in you will be darkness. And oh, how great that darkness is. And that's the truth, brother. When you don't see the living God, when you don't see spirituality, the joy of spiritual living, you talk to a person of that nature and he's dark inside. He cannot see the light because of not having a simple eye. So we learn in the first book of Genesis, chapter 26, verses 23 to 25, about the simple light. Here we learn that Isaac, blessed by Jehovah, was promised a family and the very protection of Jehovah, his God. And so what did Isaac, Isaac do? He set out building. Simplicity calls for three basic requirements. That is all. Less than all the fingers of your hands, only three. And we read of this in the book of Genesis, chapter 26, verse 25. Accordingly, Isaac built an altar there. And he called on the name of Jehovah. And he pitched his tent there. And the servants of Isaac went excavating a well there. In this verse, we see...
see three of the necessities of life and all of them so simple. We see an altar, we see a tent, and we see a well. And the passing of thousands of years has not changed these three basic simple necessities of life. So the lesson is keep your eye, your needs simple. We begin by setting a simple, basic priorities in our lives. We stress the more important things first. Isaac built an altar to call on the name of Jehovah his God. Altars represent worship, prayer. Simply stated, worship was all important, number one, in the life of the patriarch. It was close to his heart. Nothing happened, not even the grains of the field or grass which the animals eat, without acknowledging God, the provider of it all. God, in all our thoughts, is what we preserve by a simple life. We seek God and not man. When the new day dawned, when the sun rose, when the rains fell, when a new lamb was born, when the greens ripened, and there was peace in the home, these ancient patriarchs knew and believed that it was all because of God. He was the very center, at the very heart of their worship in life. There was more to life than eating and drinking. There was this part of saying thanks, expressing gratitude, worshiping the one who provided it all. Altars visibly represented their living faith in Jehovah. At these altars, prayers were said, acknowledging their gratitude to God for life. And at these altars, they sought his direction and protection. Altars represented places of worship. Altars reinforced their belief in God. It helped them to remember the great Jehovah, the provider of it all. These people lived very simplistic lives, notwithstanding they were very happy lives, filled with the spirit of Jehovah, filled with meaning, filled with peace and satisfaction. And oh, if only mankind today could experience such lives in their lives. Think about the joys of simple living, brother. It begins with God in your heart and mind. It begins with seeing the Almighty. We go on to read in the book of Genesis 26, 25, that Isaac pitched his tent there. The tent was his house his shelter. Just think how simple it is to roll out a tent. A half hour, a few yards of cloth, a cord to tie down the tent. This made for a snug rainproof home. You have a plot of grass or whatever in front of you. A shelter for the night when you stepped inside. There is no change in the ringing of the call bells, there's a, as clear inside as outside. The swish of the winds through the trees, the rushing of the water in the creeks. You're close to nature, close to the earth. You're close to God when you're in the tent. What a difference there is between a tent and a house. The great difference between a tent and a house is this. The tent introduces you to the earth while a house separates you from the earth. You don't believe that? Live in the houses of today. 20, 30, 40, 50 stories above the earth surrounded by brick and cement and smog and dirt. You don't even see a tree. And you thank God every now and then you can see the clouds. Everything separates you from God. Nothing brings you close to the great Jehovah. We learn from this 
from living close to the earth that God made life simple. The real life demands not accumulation of things, not that we surround ourselves with a whole lot of possessions, but a renunciation of excesses. Get rid of the junk, we say, that we have accumulated in life. We'll be happier for it. Every year we have house cleaning at Bethel. We need it. We don't make much, believe me, but how much junk we accumulate is shocking. I will tell you about this. It usually comes in the latter part of April or some one day in May. The whole factory, everything stops at Bethel. You've got to get in your home and clean it and throw away the junk. And they had huge hampers outside where brothers bring their junk, and you wouldn't believe it, they have a brother stationed next to the hamper, so when somebody throws it in, somebody else has to pull it out and take it into the room. We had to do that because that's what they did. They just traded the junk. They were not prepared to make the simple sacrifices of life, get rid of the useless things that we have. And this teaches us one thing, that godliness with contentment is still great gain on the verge of the 21st century. You may not believe it, but one of these days you will. See what our changes in lifestyles have done for us. Yes, People today admit that they worth more, that they have more money, but they're not as happy as they used to be. They're enjoying life less. Yes, we have taller buildings, but our tempers are shorter. We spend more, but we have little in our pockets. We buy more, enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, and everybody says we have less time. I don't have time for this. They have washers and doers and car cleaners and dryers and everything, and they can't even bake their own bread anymore as mom used to do. And that's a fact of life. We have more college degrees, but less common sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, and far more problems. We've been to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a neighbor. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We've learned how to make a living, but not how to make a life. We've added years to life, not life to years. So godlessness with contentment is still great gain. They joke about the human body and they say, how much is a body worth today? And they take it into the laboratory and they say, well, it is about 86 cents. Yes, but did you ever see they converted it into the dust? And that's what they say that dust is worth. But did you ever see dust sing like you heard up here? Dust see, dust work? No, the body is more than dust. How much is an eye valued? How much is an ear valued? How much is an arm valued? What will you give for your heart? You're ready to exchange for 86 cents. These people don't know what they're doing and what they're thinking about when you come to talk about life and its values, about man and how God created him, and all of these things. In his tent, Isaac could teach his sons and daughters about Jehovah and about the purpose of life. And his sons would grow up as men of faith, worshipers of the true and living God, Jehovah. They were totally happy, contented in their simple surroundings. And that is what many of us wished we were. We find, too, in 
Genesis chapter 26, verse 19, it tells us there that the servants of Isaac went excavating a well there. And the servants of Isaac went on digging. And so they found there a well of fresh water. Can you imagine what joy there was when those desert people found fresh water? There was dancing in the streets. There was the praising of Jehovah. There was excitement. Today, what do you do when you get fresh water? You almost have to go to the store pay some money nowadays. Or we might just turn a faucet on and we never think about Jehovah. We don't dance in the streets when we turn on the faucet. When we taste the good water, we take it for granted. Seldom think of where it comes from. Today, water is one of the great precious items on the face of the earth. And it's harder and harder to get today fresh water. And someday, man is going to have to pay the price for it. And what a blessing it is to have fresh water, even in this day and age. The presence of wells meant that the thirst of man and animals would be quenched. And in turn, animals would provide food and clothing for the people. Life was wonderful and oh so simple. Wells were essential to life. Water was necessary to keep life going. Today, water, without water, man or animals cannot live. It is a necessity to life. Water was and is the symbol of the Word of God, the Bible, the Word of God, containing the inspired thoughts of the great Jehovah, that this water, that when we drink it out of the Word of God, draws us to our God, Jehovah, makes us want to praise Him because of his thoughts, his ideas, that man cannot even think of. I was visiting a Chinese doctor that was a female, and she and I were discussing life. She was sitting behind a table there, and uh, I was on this side, I was standing, she was sitting, and she says, John, there are so many diseases. We don't even know where they come from. We don't have names for them. What is man going to do? I said, why are you worried about this? I said, one of these days, man is going to live forever. Oh, she says, you're talking spiritual to me. I said, no, I'm talking physical. Man is going to live right here upon the earth forever as, as a man. That's what God intended. Oh, she says, bah. She stood up and walked away from me. She didn't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the precious, beautiful words of God, unthinkable to man, but not to the man of God, because the Spirit reaches into all things, even into the deep things of the great Jehovah. That's where we must learn to drink. Water was and is the symbol of the living God. In the book of Psalm we read, in Psalm 42, 1 and 2, David says, My very soul longs for you, O Jehovah. My soul indeed thirsts for God, for the living God. Isn't that something? And this is the truth. You get away from the Bible for a few days and you begin to think, my, I'm starving to death. I need to hear. I need to feel. I need to know what the Word of God is saying to me. It builds us up, brothers. We, like David, thirst for the inspired word of God, of God about his kingdom, about the ransom, about the thousand-year reign of Christ, the resurrection of the dead. Just think about these things. It's beyond thinking of natural man, every last one of these things. The paradise earth. You travel from one end of the earth to the other, and you look, and you long, and you hope, and you wish, and you don't find paradise. And you open the room to walk inside, and these little 12 by 18 rooms, there's no paradise in there either. And this is one of the great commandments of God to man. And one of these days, the earth will be paradise. Eternal life and happiness. Life without end at last, we've seen. How beautiful that is. 
This is true drink for us, brothers. This is life-giving water. The book of John 7, 37 tells us about it. Jesus says in the book of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. And how beautiful that is, because none of us can do it any other way. And when we begin to drink that water in, first then do we begin to have relationship to life itself, because we come in contact with God, who is life. The good news of God's kingdom satisfies our deepest longings for justice and righteousness. You go to a court today where courts are supposed to be the symbol of justice and righteousness. And what you get out of there, you want to pull your hair out. It's everything but justice and righteousness. Our brother Burns, being in Moscow at this trial, and the, there was some Russian archbishop there, or cardinal, whatever he was, with his long garments and everything else. And he was, his crew was sitting there, and the brother, not the brother, but one of our hired attorneys, was arguing the case, and this cardinal gets up and says, Jehovah's Witnesses ought to be thrown out of the earth. They don't belong here. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Christ. They have a government of their own. And the judges clamp down, bing, bing, bing. She says, sit down or I'll throw you out. And what he does standing, he started to laugh, throw me out. I'll throw you out. This is in the Supreme Court and you expect justice and righteousness there? No way, brothers. And this is what we're facing on the face of the earth at this time. We've got to know this. We long for truth and righteousness. None of us can live happily for long apart from the Word of God, which satisfies our longings, our spiritual longings and needs. That is true water, true drink, the Word of God. Not too long ago, I ran into Nancy Yoon. Sister Yoon was released from prison in China where she served, I think, somewhere around 20 years. A lot of it was in a total confinement. Here is a beautiful woman, a woman today, and she says, Dan, when I go from house to house today, so many Chinese, many of them who were Buddhists, are attracted to the Word of God, the Bible. And she says, people ask me, why are the Buddhists wanting to turn to the Bible? And her reply was straightforward and simple. It is because the, the Bible is the Word of God, and the Word of God is for everyone. Human race, it is God's food and drink for all mankind. And so it is. It's the Word of God for everyone. How simple, how beautiful, and how true. And one of the greatest weaknesses in the theocratic organization, brothers, is the fact that we do not read the Word of God regularly. So many of us do not turn to the Bible and are not inspired by the reading of the Bible. And yet, here are, are the very words of the great Jehovah to us. And for some reason, we have find so many other things to do than are coming to the Word of God, picking it up, and reading it. Jesus Christ emphasized what the true necessities of life are in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. While he did not miss, dismiss physical food and drink, shelter and clothing as of no account, Jesus did stress that for us to seek these physical things as if they were the all-important things of life would be wrong. These physical things are, are to be subordinate to the spiritual requirements of life.
Jesus called on us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things, these necessities, will be added to us. So wells are indicative of, of spiritual food and drink that are needed for survival. Digging those wells illustrates the effort we should be willing to put forth to provide water of truth for ourselves and our families. Digging wells represents personal study, research, the toil put forth to learn the truth out of an appreciation for life itself, which is a gift from God. Something that we cannot earn. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Learning about God and doing his will are ways to satisfy both the mind and the body of the physical and spiritual man with inspired thoughts of God. However, we've got to face reality. Change is inevitable. Change is God's law. Everything around about us is changing constantly. Even now, as you sit here, you are changing. You are growing older every split second of time. I hate to tell you that, but that's the way it is. We, let's face the fact, the world has changed from Isaac's time. We have changed. Yes, Africa has changed. Think of it, five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. What great changes have swept the earth, all the earth, in every part of the earth. Living as we are in the materialistic world, nothing, nothing is simple anymore. Not even those computers. You can learn to dicker with it, but when the lights go out, Lord, what confusion there is. Then you have all the men the looking behind the scenes, wondering what it was, or what went wrong. We had one time, let me just tell you this. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take some time. In our place, we were putting up computers. And we had the IBM to help us establish this. This was in the early days. And our computer went out. Our brothers dickered with it. We had all the wise men, there were more than three, looking at this ditch. Uh, they're looking at this machine. They couldn't figure it out. And so they called IBM. IBM sends its men, not for nothing, $600 an hour. And he's sitting there like some pope, looking at this box, wondering what is wrong. And this, this was the morning, we ate lunch, we came back in the afternoon, and it so happened that I came in there about 1.30 in the afternoon, and I walked in there, and I watched them all looking at this box. And here comes a housekeeper in, in her long dress, with a mop and things that she was dusting, and she reaches over, and she puts the cord and pushes it in. And the lights come on. $600 an hour. need to discipline ourselves 
so that we do not crave material things, things worldly people mistakenly believe to be essential for a happy life. We as Jehovah's Witnesses do not measure our values by worldly standards or worldly ways or methods. The physical world would like us to believe that life is measured by the things we possess. Ah, look at that Mercedes. Well, he has a 12-room house. Yes, he's got one north, he's got one south. And he never lives in him. He's in an automobile driving all over the place. And this is the big thing. We don't find the rich people at home anymore. They're always traveling. They have a yacht, but it's anchored in port somewhere. The physical world likes us to believe that life is measured by the things we possess, but we do not believe or think that way. We should not believe or think that way. Our eyes and hearts are closed to the world, but opened wide to the kingdom of God. We see only the kingdom as mankind's only hope from all these miseries that we face. We still seek the simple life or we should be seeking it. Enjoying a relationship with Jehovah is perhaps, and no doubt, is one of the greatest blessings on earth today. Our knowing the warmth of our God who loves us, having a friend with God is something precious, brother. These are values by which we live. These make us feel rich. This is what we love about those who come into our kingdom halls. They love God, and we know God loves them. Who else could sometimes? Mother finds it hard sometimes. But God loves them. He looks at their hearts. This is joy unsurpassed, and oh, how simple it is. A preoccupation with life has turned many away from the simple life. People are holding not only one job, two jobs, three jobs. They seldom go home to sleep, wash, bathe, or anything else. You know it just by passing them. Let's be real. We no longer live in tents. We no longer build altars. Most of us do not even dig wells. A modest home has turned into stately mansions. Often those who live in them care little or nothing about God. Life has become a struggle. People doubt the existence of God. And the more money has, they have, the less they, they believe. Many religious edifices go empty. God is, for the most part, not in the thoughts of men. And here is a lesson for us to learn. The simple life cannot be lived apart from Jehovah God. The history of the 20th century proves this view. And as the vision of God fades in men, they become senseless, unreasonable, animalistic, demonic in nature. And that gets scary. And that's what we see facing us on the earth today. Our dear Apostle Peter calls them at 2 Peter 2, 12, he says, these as natural brute beasts are made to be taken and destroyed. For they speak evil of the things they understand not and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. That's the word of God coming through the mouth of the Apostle Peter, telling us about these people who are so materialistic. Peter calls them brute beasts, unreasoning animals. After they debase themselves into senseless animals, they then reach out to exterminate one another. Proof of this is overwhelming in this 20th century. Look at the most educated men are scientists, 
train making atom hydrogen bombs, making delivery systems. Destruction is all around, and these great brains are behind it all. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, we find so-called Christian nations, unique in their cruelty, destructiveness, and depravity because of their lack of faith in the living God, Jehovah. They have their gods, but they don't have the true God, Jehovah. These horrendous evils occurred precisely because great power was placed in the hands of men who have no love or fear of God, and who believe themselves restrained by no absolute code of decency or conduct as that laid out in the Word of God. Vladimir Lenin. Think of this man. His statues are still in different parts of Russia. This man murdered his own people. He not only had no religion, but he hated those who did practice religion. He learned from Karl Marx that Christianity should be destroyed because Christianity taught the quality of humility. Is that reasonable? Is that sensible? Lenin was empty of any ethical Christian guiding force whatsoever. His rulership proved to be disastrous to the human family. Stalin succeeded him. And what is Stalin? Stalin was no better he himself murdered millions of his own people. And they are still wondering how it all happened. And they mourned his death. Unthinkable. And yet it's so. Think about Adolf Hitler. Learn from the German philosopher Nietzsche. He learned that God was dead. And that God had to be replaced by the will of power. Hitler, this mass genius, so-called, built mass murder factories that exterminated millions and millions of people. He, too, was without God in his life. Come to the United States. We have a president over there who built the atomic bomb and was the first to drop it upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He incinerated huge populations of people. He's a Christian man, a Baptist no less, plays the piano. Intelligent, but without faith in the true and living God, Jehovah. These and others like them were the prized pupils of modern thinking who deliberately rejected the word of God, the Bible. They were so-called educated men embraced by higher learning without God. They were made empty, animalistic, and the Bible adds one other word, demonic. And that's right. The only valid source of a moral, decent life is faith in the true and living God, Jehovah. And only a belief in the true God will make us decent. And only by taking in an accurate knowledge of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, will we be able to maintain our sanity in this violent, senseless world. This may sound so simple, but it's true. And the truth is simple. Ours is a craving for a simple, less complicated life. Our very kingdom halls are designed and built to satisfy this spiritual need. Our halls are centered, our centers of true worship in the earth. They are built to promote the worship of the true and living God, Jehovah, and to uphold truth and righteousness in the earth. Our kingdom halls teach Christian values the love of God and the love of man, the love of simplicity, and that's why we have kingdom halls. Our kingdom halls are places where
such simple life-giving truths are elevated and promoted into the minds and hearts of those who attend. People of all nations and tongues are welcome to attend and believe freely the spiritual instruction departed as there. And we are part of this brotherhood of man. Not even the finest buildings, brothers, not even the greatest palaces or mansions, not even the very best of social services will bring us satisfaction and happiness if our lives are not embraced by the worship of God. In our kingdom halls, we learn that life, no matter how rich it may be, lived apart from God will lead to sure frustration and disappointment. Apart from God, no man will succeed. That is the lesson of history, both ancient and modern. Life without God destroys the very humanity of man. It ruins man's dignity and nobility. Without God, mankind quickly degenerates into subhuman. When the image of God fades completely from men's minds, they may retain an intellectual capacity. They are able to make even more complex machines but they cease to be human. They cease to be loving. These men cease to be compassionate beings. Selfishness has taken them over. By separating ourselves from God, people become creatures without faith. Their ethical vitality and morality fades out of existence and they become nothing better than a species of clever animals. And if that were to happen, brothers, mankind's ultimate fate would be too terrible, too horrible, even to contemplate. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, we find so-called Christian nations unique in their cruelty, in their destructiveness, and in their depravity, because they have no faith in the true God. The simple life was and is beautiful because it is sustained by the Spirit of the living God. Let's look at buildings. Buildings are simply empty shells without the Spirit of God in them. Without God, cities become jungles. Without God, nations have turned their consciousless mass of humanity and destroy one another. Think of Kosovo. People preying upon people. Think of Uganda, Rwanda, right this day in Indonesia. What has happened in other places on the face of the earth. People preying on people because they have no faith in the true and living God. That's how scary it is. The Bible tells us this truth, that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were empty shells without the righteous man Lot. And when the angels removed Lot, God destroyed those cities because they are worthless without the Spirit of God in them. The Temple of Jerusalem, despite its magnificence and its beauty, was nothing to God without men of faith in that temple. God had the Babylonians come down there and burn that temple to the ground. Even a world, a world without faith, meant nothing to God. God destroyed it by the flood of waters, but he preserved eight souls alive in the ark. Only a people dedicated to the worship of Jehovah gives buildings, cities, nations their value. Without faith, they are absolutely nothing. We must remember, brothers, that our study and belief in God's Word, our simple life, 
coming together at meetings in kingdom halls and assembly halls is what saves us from such a disaster. We have a sister who lives and works, not lives so much, she lives most of the day, in the 86th story of the Twin Towers building. And I say, as long as that sister is there, Jehovah is going to preserve that building from falling. Because his spirit is there. But once he removes her, Lord help him, that whole city can go down. Because New York, as far as New York is concerned, it's ruled on an earthquake fault. God can just open it up. I often wondered what to do, or how to get rid of that city. And Jehovah has a simple solution. Just open the earth and bye-bye. And this is a big truth. Only a people dedicated to the worship of Jehovah give buildings, cities, nations their value, brothers. That's why how important you are. That is what God is looking at. And he's calling people out of all nations, kindreds and people of tongues today, bringing them together to preserve them, not to live in the system of things, but in the one to come. We must remember, brothers, that our study and belief in God's word, our simple life coming together at meetings, saves us from a destruction. Our kingdom holds our worship, preserves this value by promoting spirituality in a very materialistic society. We talk about our simple life, a simple, warm relationship, and this we do not want to lose. When we gather together to worship our God as we do in our kingdom halls, we are forced to recognize that our spiritual needs, we see our true selves in everyday life, things that need to be corrected. We are here to enjoy true peace. If we're to enjoy true peace and security, we have to make changes in our lives. Attendance at the kingdom hall reminds us that we are persons morally responsible that we are persons answerable to God for our actions, and how good it is for us to hear and to believe this. So Kingdom Hall attendance is a vital factor that restrain, restrains the dark side in us, the sinful side. Our drift to evil cannot be corrected entirely by our own resources. We need help from God and from our brothers to keep our dark side under control. And that is what our regular worship together at Kingdom Halls provides. He does this by laying down a code of conduct which we do not make up for our, by our own convenience or for our own convenience or alter at whim. This code of law and principles comes to us through God's Word, the Bible, and is unchangeable. We must forever be conscious of the fact that our meetings are extraordinary occasions which we must not take for granted or to be taken lightly. When we meet together with our children, when we meet together with others and come together for the sole purpose to honor and worship Jehovah, what a delightful experience that is. Even the angels of heaven rejoice. In our meetings, we measure ourselves not by the standards of success or failure, but by the yardstick of eternity, because we want to live forever. We are chosen by God to live forever in happiness. We want to give that thought, brothers. We ask ourselves, am I ready for such an honorable life? And if not, how can I become so? It is important daily to be, be asking ourselves these questions. Bad as we may be, we are still putting forth all honest effort to correct our ways in harmony with the will of God, and that is what God sees in us. Our struggle to want to do what is right. And that is, and it is that.
that effort of ours that God finds so precious, it endears us to him. And he calls us the apple of his eye, the precious things of all nations. One thing sure, we would be infinitely worse off without putting forth the effort of right or to right our wrongs. Our meetings help us to keep on trying. That is what makes our kingdom halls so indispensable to our worship. It helps us as a society of people to draw close to Jehovah, our God, on a regular basis. We as Jehovah's Witnesses know that the only valid source of a moral life is a living God. Our belief in Jehovah gives us the power of faith and the ability to see him by means of our faith. And of course, we see at present, as Paul says, through a glass rather darkly. But for us, that glimpse darkly through a glass is enough for now. Therefore, we do our best to cultivate the spirit of dependence on God. We trust in our God, Jehovah, with all our heart. We lean not to our understanding, but in all our ways we acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. We're not going to be clever in our own eyes, but we're going to fear Jehovah and depart from that which is bad. Clever men, brilliant, physical men have been prone to rely on their own understanding and ingenuity. Often they fail for that very reason. They are shocked when their schemes backfire and their whole operations fail to work. Here in our lovely dwellings, let us learn to be spiritual men and women. Let us learn to trust in Jehovah. Let's learn to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on the hope set before us, resting our faith on him who is King of kings, Lord of lords, for everlasting life. Look ahead to the new day of his making and rejoice greatly in the hope ahead. And may this great, marvelous God of ours, Jehovah, bless each and every one of you richly, brothers. And as you uphold that simple life, may you God-fearing people walk the way of life unto eternal life. Yes, sir. It's come time now for us to dedicate these facilities, these buildings that have been built, a number of them, but I must be honest to confess that I haven't even raised a finger to build. I didn't lift a brick or lay a cement or light a match, or do anything toward these buildings. And so I'm a little nervous standing here wanting to dedicate these. I have nothing to do with the building, and I feel that it would be more appropriate if some of our brothers who have worked hard on these buildings, and some of them have worked hard on them for years, would stand up and make a motion that these buildings be dedicated to the great God Jehovah, to his glory and praise, and that Jehovah spirit would rest here from here on on to all eternity as long as these buildings exist. And that our heartfelt prayer is that we, each and every one of us, will care for these properties, that we'll labor and love to make them reflect Jehovah's glory from now on to all eternity. Is there anyone here that will stand to make this motion? Brother Keaton, come up here. Let's hear what he has to say, what kind of motion he makes for us. Too bad we don't have a roving mic. Let's spark in you as you move. Brother Siddick, all I thought I had to say was that I move that these buildings be dedicated to Jehovah. Say that to the brothers, not to me. Well, I would like to move that we dedicate these extended facilities to our Creator, Jehovah. According 
to the rules. This has to be second. And we, we have Brother Booner here. Where is he? Over here. You're going to second it. I hope he's not any longer than that. I second that we dedicate these buildings to our God Jehovah. All you brothers have heard the motion and heard the second. If you believe in it, say yes, and then let's hear the applause to the glory of God. Yeah.